introduction but this is his very very strong bad cv he is the president elect of iip 2021 give a big round of applause for that he was the honorary general secretary the first national election for a national for the honorary general secretary and he he won there also with with uh, meritorious ease and he was iip central hsc for about 2000 for two years 2018 2019 is a fiap is a diplomate of the pediatric endocrinological health international pediatric association member of the environmental health technical advisory group of, of the international pediatric association and that's where he's going to he's destined to be in a few years from now he's going to be somewhere in the international scene soon and we wish him all the best he was editor of enrich editor of many textbooks journals and authorized chapters in textbooks and he's been central ip member four times national president of the environmental child group of the central iep in 2017-18 president nf kerala 2015-16 secretary iep kerala 2009-2010 and is now working as a senior consultant in hod of pediatrics at apollo adlex hospital cochin over to you uh, ramesh for your proceedings thank you for being with us today thank you dr jason sir for that sweet introduction uh, respected president of the host branch dr pramod secretary dr sajit beloved president of indian academy of pediatrics kerala state branch dr narayan for executive board members dr abraham hold dr shimmi all seniors dr tony mamballi dr venu gopal and many others dr kamath i am not seeing but all my great seniors and friends in iip cochin scientific coordinator of the program and the academician who leads for chief on the front dr jason unni the scientific faculty for the day dr suma balan dr mahesh dr rajapambulai and our dear rojo and my dear friends in iip cochin and iip kerala and who are logged in for the day good evening and it's a great privilege to be with my host branch or my home branch right now i'm so privileged with to be in kochi at this moment and here back i joined came back to kochi from patanandetta and that was another day Uh, i'm so happy that our national president dr bakul parek sir is also around yes good evening ramesh good evening uh, i'm so happy that you're so most welcome sir i'm so you're yes. so happy and privileged iip kochi master you are there i have to be here <laughs> i am also from your group ah <laughs> uh, yes yeah, sir so i been in dr jeevan and the whole at kochi dr narayan and promotes with and the whole of faculty dr suma and dr suma are all privileged to have our national president a great academician the leader who had such a visionary who put iap on a digital map with us today for the evening welcome sir once again on behalf thank you of thank, you, thank you ramesh yeah. so it's great going and i am so happy that i am coaching right now as as i have been um, studying of a few minutes ago and, and we had from coaching sessions and then Dr. Jason himself, I was scientific team of IAP coaching. Sure. I am so happy that this portfolio has endeared itself to the postgraduates as well as the practitioners on a big terms and a different time like case presentations. Every time a case, the case is taken up, and it's it is. I'm so happy it is dissected by renowned academicians across the country. Uh, we have seen that it was from maybe from the premier institutes like All India Institute. PGI or Jipmer or from the CPGI or all the academicians of Nithin and all others across the country have been involved in this academy program and I congratulate IAP Cochin and especially Dr. Jason and the scientific team behind this for making this as such a sought after academic session for the last one year in the challenging COVID times and making it so dear to the practitioners. Uh, friends, uh, for that, I'm so happy and thank you so much for IAP Cochin for the um, sweet words and the, all the, the opportunity for me here. And, and in fact, I'm privileged to be around with you all for the day. And once again, thank, 
Guys, we are thanks to Dr. Bakul sir. Would you like to have something, sir? Or not two words? A single line. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Kumar is our great hero from the day when he won All India HSG for the first time, and he has continued with that uh, uh, feather in the cap by adding his presidency as a president elect for 2021. Uh, and I am really thankful to all you friends for helping in getting elected Ramesh Kumar to this coveted post. And my all the best wishes are there with him, and I am always going to be uh, there with him whenever needed. So all the best, Ramesh, for your new tenure. Thank you so much, sir. I'm so indebted to you for that. Always the guys, guys, great support and the confidence you have given me, and you have been so dear into Kerala and the UP coaching. In fact, I believe when such is around. Yes, so, yes. so good uh, good friends uh, we'll be back with uh, we are in back with the academics so we have got uh, our youngster engro here out here dr rojo uh, who is uh, having a, a, the the tale of a unique sepsis in a 6 and a half months old because we have been so i've been discussing with uh, dr suma right now before the session itself whether it is missy or misc so it's a multi system inflammatory syndrome in a child So, so I have heard our friends across talking about Missy. Some of the others will be discussing mm -hmm. Miss. But what lies in the name? As Pramod has suggested, it's all how the way you get along with it. So let's get going with the Missy or the Miss, which is. The, so we have has got very masquerading presentations, and so as you have learned, it's more like a sepsis right now, in which is taken as a bag. And now we are learned to live with Missy as a sepsis presentation. And Dr. Rojo is here. He has got a child with a unique tail, or maybe as put it as a six and a half child with sepsis. Uh, Rojo is a young bro who has uh, come out with the, the alumni of the, the Jawaharlal Nehru Postgraduate Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education, the Sir Pondicherry, and he has come out with a gold medal in MGP Pediatrics in Jipmar. That's a great going, Dr. Rojo. And he has got a gold medal for the best paper in the Tamil Nadu State Conference in 2013. And later on, he has been the NRP instructor and fellowship coordinator uh, with IAP, and he has got a DM neonatology later on from Jipmar itself. Uh, he is now attached with the Lutz Hospital in Kochi as a consultant neonatologist and pediatrician, and he has got a quite a lot number of publications in three international and twenty international publications to study. And that's now uh, we are looking forward to Rojo to present the case and uh, take us forward for further discussion from our experts later on. Oh, it's now time for Dr. Rajo. Please, Rajo. Thank you, sir, for that uh, kind introduction. <clears throat> As sir mentioned, we have. Um, I'm going to present a uh, narrate a tale of a unique sepsis. Uh, it was a story of a six and a half month old baby who was brought to us one fine day into our evening for casualty with a fever of one day duration, an unresponsiveness, unnever. There's no history of any trauma, drug overdose, loose stools, vomiting, or cough. mother has upper respiratory tract infection for the last two days the child was on examination it was totally unresponsive only movement was a deep pain response it was febrile otherwise head to foot was normal it all the features of shock he had tachycardia and what was maintaining saturation with high flow oxygen uh, pupils were sluggishly reacting to light but hyperresponsive hypotonic and hyporeflexic and abdomen was distended there was no mass bowel sounds were sluggish chest was clear And uh, cardiovascular examination showed a uh, sinus tachycardia, but there was no S3 gallop. So we we could diagnose it as a septic shock. But billion dollar question was what was the reason? Uh, the, unfortunately, the uh, we did a rapid antigen test that came out to be positive, and unfortunately the mother also was positive on the same day, and the father turned out to be positive on the very next day. The main thing was a golden hour management for this baby. So we tried to normalize the temperature with suppositories and uh, and tepid sponging right in the ED itself, and taking care of all the necessary precautions. The child was intubated right in the emergency department. Circulation was maintained with three fluid boluses, taking care of uh, make sure there's no volume overload. And since it was a mainly a perfusion pressure rather than a pr pressure problem, so we started on the on him on dobutamol support. Dextrose measurements were high. But ketones were negative. The first line antibiotics was initiated within the first hour of life, in first hour of admission. And while we were planning to shift this baby to the ICU, we noted the child had a one episode of tonic posturing within this particular period, for which we gave lorazepam was loaded with phosphenetoin 
uh, and, and uh, along with this, the child also had multiple episodes of coffee colored vomiting. And since he suspected DIC in this kid, uh, we gave a dose of vitamin K and was started on antacid and was shifted to isolation ICU by maintaining airway, breathing, and the circulation. While in ICU, uh, the child was connected to the ventilator. With an, uh, since the lungs was compliance was reasonably fine, we given general ventilation strategy. It was a strong clinical suspicion of MIUC because he had CNS cardiovascular and uh, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms and when the results of the investigations were out, we discussed with the parents uh, regarding it and we give first dose, we give the dose of IV AG 2 gram per kg and was also started on pulse methylprednisolone at 5 milligram per kg and once the results of LFT was out, there was not much derangement of the liver enzymes, IV remdesivir was also started with, since the child was antigen positive. But the main Crux was on the uh, supported treatment. So the child was given inotropic support was continued. Fluid and electrolyte management was given adequate and the glucose homeostasis was maintained. And even after adequate dose of vitamin K, since the uh, FF, I mean, PT and APTT and coagulation profile was altered, it was one dose of FFP was given after uh, taking care of fluid and electrolyte balance and maintenance phosphantine was continued. This was a counts on day one, which showed a reasonably normal SP the slight elevation of count and ESR was okay. A clinical count was also normal. Uh, CRP at this point of time was normal. As I mentioned, SGOT was slightly elevated, but RFT, LFT was reasonably fine at this point of time. Uh, PT, APTT, as I mentioned, was high and the inflammatory markers were sky high. d was 3,644. Uh, troponin was elevated. LDH was high and fibrinogen was normal for his age group. This was the X-ray. Uh, on the day one, as you can see, the lungs are reasonably well expanded with little bit of infiltrates. We did an ultrasound abdomen also on day one that was found to be normal. And EC showed evidence of sinus tachycardia. There was no evidence of myocarditis. So we continued the same management day one. Day two, the same thing was continued except the remdesiv was changed to maintenance dose. The rest of the measures were same. Cardiology consultation was done and myocardial function was normal. Re remember that it was done actually uh, after the VAG and uh, the child was on ventilator with an adequate amount of PEEP and repeat PTA, PTT was normal. So we started on low molecular weight heparin also. This was a count on day two, which showed a slightly dipping count and the CRP started slightly rising up, plated also slightly coming down. Uh, sodium, potassium, potassium was slightly on the lower side. PTA, PTT got normalized. D-dimer also started coming down with this uh, day two. But unfortunately, everything was going smooth. On day three, the child started having again multiple episodes of seizures. In fact, he had a status epileptics on day three and was given, uh, even though the metabolic profile was normal at this point of time, and was given initial lorazepam, again loaded 10 mg per kg of phenytoin, who given you know, seizures were persisting, so gave levitracetam and required metazolam infusion with the metazolam of six microgram per kg, kg per minute. Actually, the seizures started setting up. We could do an ultrasound cranium, even though they, since the AF was open, and so it showed a diffuse cerebral edema, and we started on anti-edema measures with 3% uh, saline. Chest X-ray showed increasing infiltrates, and since the child had a little bit of basal crabs, we thought possibility of a pulmonary edema, and so anti-edema measures was also started, and echo repeated, which showed a mild myocardial dysfunction, but coronaries were all normal at this point of time. Child continued to have persistent fever spikes on day three, on day one, day two, and day three, and since CRP was showing a rising trend, antibiotics were upgraded, pulse methylprednisolone and remdesivir was continued. This was X-ray on day three. Sorry for the chain, because we didn't have a trusty bystander to give off the chain of and uh, this was x-ray which shows increasing infiltrates on the x-ray. Um, uh, the fever, uh, day four, the fever again persisted. The question was uh, show that repeat an IVIG. Uh, then we tried slightly hiking up the methylprednisolone pulse dose from five to 10 for two days. And antibiotics were also upgraded from uh, to meropena even though blood culture was sterile with, even though we were waiting around the bush. And we'll still continue the anti-convulsants, anti-edema anti measures, and antiviral measures were continued. The CRP, as I mentioned, was 32.6. LDH was slightly coming down, 789. LFT was normal. Sodium was slightly higher, maybe because of the anti-edema measures which were given the person saline. Potassium normalized. PT, APTT was under normal control. D-dimer reduced from 3,600 to 378. RFT was also normal. And day five, luckily, the fever spice started coming down. There was no clinical seizure, so midazolam infusion was started, was slightly reduced. OG feeds was initiated. 
inotropes and anti edema measures were started weaning and gradually the ventilator settings are also weaned from day 5 and this was a repeat blood investigations on day 5 showed a crp was sort of sort of stable sodium potassium was normal and less uh, sgpt and rft was also within the normal range and this was a counts during the first 4 days of admission you can see on day 3 the count has slightly dipped to 5000 from what was the initial counts and the plated also was slightly on the lower side and slowly slowly as the fever starts I mean the uh, with this uh, coming uh, coming down the counts also started coming up with this particular treatment and plated was uh, within the normal range throughout and from day 6 onwards so we stopped the pulse methyl prednisolone and we stopped remdesivir and uh, in fact Uh, as per Dr. Suma's advice, we uh, we tried dexamethasone for two days because there was evidence of cerebral edema, and thereafter we changed on to the maintenance methyl prednisolone that is one mg per kg per dose BD, I mean uh, per dose BD, um, uh, per dose, and we stopped remdesivir, and we did Trunat on day seven was positive, as expected, and broad spectrum antibiotics was continued, and midazolam was tapered, OG feeds were increased, and inotropes were weaned. and further course and uh, that we could we, we slowly slowly reduce the settings on ventilator reduce the inotropic settings and uh, since there was a clinically the seizures had come down we extubated the kid on day 10 and was changed to low flow nasal cannula taking care of all the necessary precautions and uh, methyl prednisone pulse therapy was given for two day, I mean uh, maintenance dose was given for two days and thereafter it was changed to oral prednisolone and we continued levetiracetam since it was difficult to maintain phenytoin because it has a first order kinetics we changed to oxcarbamazepine and inotrop of weaned and stopped and serial monitoring of d-dimer ferritin and ldh showed a decreasing trend and day 14 trunat luckily came out to be negative and this was a repeat chest x-ray which showed reasonably well expanded lung uh, compared to the previous one even though we had serial x-rays we could uh, i could not i did not put the, all the x-rays and further course after extubation we noticed that the child started having an abnormal movement which was found to have a uh, dystonia and the eeg also was done to confirm this and the uh, and even though there was slow background and was dystonic movements were i mean uh, movement could be because of uh, dystonia an mri was done and uh, since it was a, a possibility of dystonia we started him the kid on trihexyphenidyl keeping a watch on the bowel and bladder distension the mri showed um, uh, hypoxic changes throughout I mean, especially in the periorolantic areas, and there was a diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia and the corpus uh, and in the uh, corpus callosum I mean, the uh, basal ganglia regions. And uh, and since the child became was maintaining saturation on after that, we weaned off oxygen, maintaining saturation on room air. The seizures started coming down. The stunia started becoming better. Child was accepting oral feeds. We shifted out the uh, child out of ICU on day 16 of admission. and we tried oral feeds slightly even though we was initially on og feeds tried gradually tried oral feeds to our surprise the child started accepting little bit little bit and slightly it became full on oral feeds the gentle therapy was initiated all the blood pictures start normalizing except for ldh or possibly maybe because of that uh, dystonia of the child had the oral prednisolone weaning also was initiated and now the child uh, after uh, uh, shutting up the icu the child was maintaining saturation on room air dystonia started reducing uh, no clinical and allopurgic seizures child was accepting oral feeds well the inflammatory markers were all reduced echo was repeated echo was normal physiotherapy and diet regimen was started and more importantly the parents were confident of taking care of this infant the child was discharged on 26th day of admission and was accepting oral feeds uh, though the slight tone abnormality was present and was on anti epileptic drugs that is on levetiracetam as well as oxcarbamazepine and was on pacitane also and was started in regimen of oral prednisolone and was started on multivitamins as well as on physiotherapy i would like to thank uh, uh, dr suma dr rajapan and dr shreeja of sat from my side and not not last but not the least the almighty for helping us to treat this critically ill infant over to you dr suma suma madam Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajo, for that uh, very interesting case. And uh, as you said, thank God Almighty for uh, coming out very successful like this on day 26, given the standards of any any missed setting. Uh, now we have got a panel of experts to dissect the case. Listen, um, sir. Next slide. Listen. Uh, we have got uh, another 
stalwart i would say uh, and uh, who holds a legacy of again jipma uh, pondicherry with her uh, she dr dr suma is there with us and she is uh, got mbbs and md pediatrics from uh, jipma as well as mrcp from uk and uh, she is uh, uh, pro the professor and pediatric rheumatologist at aims and she heads the department of rheumatology and clinical immunology at amrita institute and uh, i must uh, I cannot resist mentioning a word about Dr. Suma here because I've been referring from when I was in Pandalam, uh, we got a lot number of cases to her, and I still remember um, a lot many patients, especially those patients with Kikuji and disease and other patients whom they used to call her and how uh, how caring she was with them and how popular she was with the patients. That was something which uh, I I always used to tell the other seniors: you must uh, keep keep her connected with your patients wherever they are. That stands in good stead for you all through your life. So that is something their prayers always take us through. So I believe Dr. Suma has been there along with their clinical acumen and academics that also stands good for her everywhere in her uh, career. And uh, we are, now I invite Dr. Suma to have her uh, the, the take take the case forward first from her side. Over to Dr. Suma. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, and uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Rojo, that was a very very nice succinct presentation. Uh, now let's move on to MISC. So what exactly is it? This is a very new disease and we first started hearing about it in April this year. A warning came from UK. It was a new disease. They were seeing children presenting in a very sick state. And what was happening was that it, uh, everywhere, about three to four weeks after the peak of COVID-19 in the community was when these children were presenting to hospital in peaks. And uh, this is considered to be an immune dis dysregulation induced disorder. So in except in those children who are RT-PCR positive, this is not an infective problem. It is an immunological problem. And so a good part of the management involves immunomodulation. Then the reports start coming in from elsewhere. Next slide, please. And as we can, uh, you know, first it was newspaper accounts in India from Calcutta, Chennai, and here you can see the link, you know, as COVID-19 cases peak in the community, MISC starts going up. And then in uh, even the pediatric rheumatology team, we actually uh, raised an alert in May. After the newspaper reports, the publication started coming out, small series, then large series. And next one, please. So now we have many series reported. Unfortunately, in late October, the director of ICMR persists in saying that this condition has not been reported in India, which is very sad to see this. Next, please. And so if we just go on to this discussion, we I want to actually uh, create an understanding of what MISC is and what is the spectrum of clinical phenotypes. How do we recognize and how do we treat and how do we investigate? So when do you suspect as rheumatologists, our greatest skill, I think, is pattern recognition. So everything we see in patterns, we see phenotypes. So here it is a case of any child with a high-grade fever, with significant inflammation, and with a multi-system, usually a multi-system, rarely a single system, the dysfunction that you can see. There is often a possible link with COVID, something that we will discuss uh, subsequently. Of course, this is not an, you know, this situation doesn't say that there's only one diagnosis possible. We do need to exclude other diagnoses as well. There are three clinical case definitions now available. One is from the CDC uh, from Atlanta. The other is from the RCPCH and the third is from the WHO. And basically they just expand on the same theme that I told you. So the clinical features which is mostly fever, the lab evidence of inflammation, the multi-system involvement, and the link with COVID-19. Uh, this is the basis of these um, case definitions. The difference between the WHO and the CDC, WHO says zero to 19 years, CDC says less than 21 years. WHO wants more than three days fever, whereas CDC says just one day fever is fine. The rest of it is very similar. Next. So the uh, so the clinical criteria, the main one is high grade fever. And for evidence of inflammation, we're not just looking at CRP and ESR. We're looking also at very elevated fibrinogen if it's present. 
very elevated D-dimers. Ferritins in these patients are not usually four digit. They're usually high three digit numbers that we're seeing. Elevated LBH, for those who can do cytokine studies, elevated IL-6. And another thing is that usually these patients, many of our sepsis patients, we tend to see high counts. These are patients with sort of um, total counts itself will be slightly reduced, but predominantly there will be lymphopenia and there's often hypoalbuminemia as well. And the multi-system involvement, that is where you have to recognize the way the child is presented. So high-grade fever with shock or arrhythmias, with respiratory involvement, with renal involvement, with neurological involvement, hematological involvement, gastrointestinal features like abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, etc. And, and significant skin changes. Now you can see that, you know, because of the kind of clinical phenotypes we are seeing, many different professionals can end up seeing these children, which is why the awareness is important. How do these children tend to present to us? So there are, again, three distinct groups of patients that you can see. You can see MISC without an acute COVID-19 overlap or a KD presentation. And Rojo's child, if I had an acute COVID-19 overlap, Okay, did not have any KD features at all. So these, about one third of patients present like this without an acute COVID-19 overlap or any evidence of Kawasaki disease. These children are particularly important that we must try and diagnose them because they often present in shock with GI symptoms and they could be taken up by a pediatric surgeon, let us say for an exploratory laparotomy if we don't think about this. They often have shock, they have cardiac dysfunction and very, very high inflammatory markers. And this group of children are usually RT-PCR negative. It's only if you do the antibody, you might find that the antibody is positive. Now, then you have MISC with overlapping with acute COVID-19. That is what Rojo had. So these patients will of often have inflammatory features, multi-system features, as well as respiratory involvement this group did tend to have the higher degree of uh, mortality in this cohort of MISC and morbidity as well, which again, you can see Rojo's patient did have considerable problems. Then you have MISC presenting in a syndrome that overlaps with Kawasaki disease. Often it is an incomplete Kawasaki presentation. They may have significant rash, they may have some conjunctivitis, they may have some peripheral edema, but they may not fit criteria to call it a complete KD. Most of these will have shock and evidence of myocardial dysfunction. So that's something we have to be careful about. So they look, uh, they don't have the full picture of KD, but they are often severe uh, in presentation. And these patients can be both uh, usually serology positive with uh, sometimes they can have RT-PCR positive and usually they can be negative. So these are some of the uh, scutaneous and other clinical manifestations that makes you think of Kawasaki disease. Very large, these kind of, uh, the rashes can be very large also in these patients. Next, next please. Um, I'm not talking about individual cases because this is more about, I'm hoping to generate a discussion, but I thought if you just see a series that Kolkata is, um, they have created a registry and they have created the series of cases. There were 32 cases. And this registry is almost a month old now. They probably have many more cases since then. So the median age of their patients was five. In most of the Western series uh, reported, the median age was actually eight or nine years old. And they had a significant population under five years of age, which is again important. That was not the case reported in the Western population. Boys more than girls. And the median hospital stay was about 10 days. And you can see the clinical features, all the things that we discussed, fever present in all, then the others had rash, conjunctivitis, loose tool, pain, abdomen, etc. And of, this is also very important. So about 50% were RT-PCR positive and 62.5% were antibody positive. But interestingly, 25% only had contact history of SARS-CoV-2 exposure. Now, this is very important because often what you get is people think of, uh, you know, don't, think it is not missed because we don't have a cast iron exposure for COVID. We do need sometimes to ask them very, very searching questions. And sometimes we may not find the link because we have community transmission. 
we have not been testing at extremely high rates, it is quite possible that we may not find a proven case in uh, association with the patient, but they could still have, um, uh, you know, they could still have COVID exposure previously. Antibody testing was not widely available for a long time to make our problems, uh, to add to our woes. And many of these patients required oxygen. Next. And you look at the labs, it's again the same. You can see that the total counts are uh, all, you know, slightly on the lower side, but the lymphocyte count, there's a lymphopenia, the platelet count is on the lower side of normal. The inflammatory markers are very high, CRP, ferritin, proBNP, fibrinogen, D-dimer, et cetera. And 30% uh, uh, of these patients had coronary artery aneurysms. 43% had left ventricular dysfunction. So certainly a very significant group. Next. And about 46% did not require ventilation, which meant that at least 50% did. And so again, uh, you know, very sick children, these can be. And treatment-wise, immunotherapy, what did they do? 50% got away with just IVIG, whereas the others had only one required only steroids, whereas the others had IVIG with steroids or with, with biologics as well. And one child died in their list. So how do you differentiate Kawasaki that is coming at this time and Kawasaki associated with MISC? So generally, the Kawasaki associated with MISC does tend to be older children. This is reported from the Western population. So I don't know whether this still holds good for us because we are seeing a number of MISC in younger children. GI symptoms are a significant uh, difference because in the MISC patients, they still have quite a few GI symptoms. There's a lot more myocardial dysfunction and shock than you would normally see in Kawasaki patients. And the counts, usually in Kawasaki, your counts are extremely high. Platelet counts become very high. That is not a feature that you see here. And at the same, we think that the coronary artery aneurysms are still at least similar to KD shock. Differential diagnosis, a very wide range of conditions. So we have to keep these in mind. But if, you know, more importantly, don't presume it is one of these. When you see children present with this clinical phenotype, think of MISC and, and go and look for all the features that will help you rule it out. Next. So what is the algorithm for investigation? So when you have a child in your casualty, you could have a child with a high-grade fever, an established link to COVID, and obvious clinical features that make you think of MISC. In these patients, you would go directly for all the investigations. You want to do all the lab parameters for inflammation. You could have a child who, has, who comes with fever and shock. You don't know what the cause of shock is. In these patients, again, you would want to probably do, uh, if they have shock, and you're suspecting a MISC because of high-grade fever, again, go ahead for all the tier investigations. However, you have a suspected, you have a child with fever, you don't really think you have corroborating clinical features, you don't have shock, then you do a tiered investigations for MISC. The first round, you do things like you do count, you do uh, metabolic profile, you do CRP, ESR, and COVID-19 testing. Depending on this, if you're seeing unexplained inflammation, you're seeing disordered metabolic parameters and you're seeing uh, COVID link, then definitely go for the tier two investigations, which are my NT pro BNP, D dimer, procal, ferritin, LDH, triglycerides, etc., and then ECG and echo. And how would you manage these patients? So the first thing, suspect and try and identify what clinical phenotype you're dealing with. If your child is sick, in shock, and very sick overall, admit in the ICU. You need to call friendly neighborhood uh, friends, your pediatric cardiologist, etc., to help you. Uh, the supportive treatment, as Rojo has underlined in every single slide that he presented, is very, very important. That has to go coexist along with the, uh, you know, absolute treatment. And you would want to think, you know, I'm not going to talk too much in detail because we have both a cardiologist and an intensive care person speaking after this. So when you have, um, you know, then you think about the actual immunomodulatory treatment for these patients. Remember that when you think of MISC, the treatment is not just supportive. It has to also include immunomodulatory treatment. What would you choose? So you have a PCR positive 
acute covid link child with a, a incomplete kd presentation who doesn't have shock you give them antivirals and ivig and ivig please has to be 2 g per kilo continuous infusion don't take days over it finish it over 12 to 16 hours that's the way it works best if the child has had past infection with uh, uh, with covid and now has kd features ivig with low dose aspirin you would use aspirin only when platelets have come up to an acceptable range and consider steroids if there are features of myocarditis if there are other features here you might consider adding steroids to the mix and what dose of steroids depending on the state of the child you might want to go for lower pulses of 5 to 10 mg per kilo per day or oral steroids 2 mg per kilo per day the child is really really stable however if your child has myocarditis shock uh, which can be tss or kd predominant these patients require high dose steroids as well as ivig the other very important thing when you've given your high dose steroids for 3 days methylprednisolone 30 mg per kilo per day please continue with oral steroids after that don't stop 3 days of steroid alone is not going to uh, ameliorate the condition it needs management for a bit longer and if these children don't settle you've done all this you've identified risk you're giving the appropriate supportive therapy you've given ivig you've given pulse steroids and your child is still not settling please call me we'll decide what is the next drug that is useful depending on what phenotype we're dealing with some children require prophylactic anticoagulation rajapan will be discussing that these children require one just the previous slide once more please these children require daily labs if their inflammation and fever are persisting we may need to consider biologicals and depending on the phenotype are we dealing with just inflammation are we dealing with coronary inflammation we will choose whether we are going for anti tnf or we are going for anti il6 and so the conclusion is this is a new disease we all need to recognize it we all need to think about it and think of this possibility when you see a child with fever shock atypical kd presentation or an acute abdomen this is a relevant investigations go for early immunomodulation and supportive therapy and remember the sequela can be harsh i'm here to help all of you and get a lot of pediatricians calling me up uh, from various parts of the state and i'm very happy to help each and every one of you i wish to say we should start a registry and compile all our cases together that is something that can really help and i have the outline for that i can even help you with antibody tests done free for your patient <laughs> in this uh, context i'll stop here and let the others take over thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Soma, for that. Uh, I feel the lucid description that the answer as I put it, and uh, you have covered the the the, the, the various phenotypes as exactly as the phenotype that is very important. Uh, that could be uh, the management guidelines. Uh, and as noted by you correctly we need to have a registry as the calcutta city had possibly probably a month back there are 39 cases as you have put but i believe much more cases are there and uh, more cases are going to be there after the covid surge in our situation also so it's high time we should go for a registry especially at least in gochi as you have suggested it involved in the big corporates now let's uh, move into the how the pediatric heart could be analyzed uh, the, the cardiology aspects can be aware i know but the person no better than dr mahesh kapnail is there with us today uh, dr mahesh is a, uh, is a not uh, the professor of pediatric cardiology and pediatric cms of the amrita institute and he, he has got a 16 years in pediatric cardiology experience and 25 years of clinical experience as such lot of index publications more than 40 and uh, uh, quite a common uh, regular uh, in international and national levels as a faculty more than 100 lectures uh, is there is interest include uh, the cardiac imaging advanced uh, cardiac interventions as well as 3d printing and device innovations and multiple national and international awards of research and innovation and he presently uh, this is our next slide uh, heads the uh, amrita institute uh, the cardiology pediatric cardiology division and i'm sure dr mahesh 
in a within be there to give us a quick and very 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 clear insight into the cardiology aspects of uh, the miss misc uh, dr mahesh please uh, thank you very much uh, dr ramesh for the introduction just a small correction i'm not the head of pediatric cardiology at amrita it's dr krishna kumar and i'm very privileged to be working with dr krishna kumar who's been a very visionary and pioneering a pediatric cardiologist for the state and for the nation and um, uh, when we thought about this particular symposium uh, dr suma and me we we've been discussing this topic over the last several months ever since covid broke out and we were uh, being continuously alarmed by by this new phenomenon of misc that was uh, beginning to occur across the world and we knew that it was coming to kerala and as the cases began to peak over here we were pretty sure that november december we would see uh, a misc cases coming to kerala and we felt that we need to really be uh, prepared for the battle that lies ahead and one of the most important parts of this battle is uh, to raise awareness for all of us as pediatricians uh, even if practicing individual sub specialties it's so important for all of us to be aware of it anticipate it expect it and that's the crux to you know early detection and management and that's the primary agenda of this particular uh, symposium that all of us come together on a common platform discuss this issue so that we can clarify our doubts and and we know what to do and how to react in this situation we've had ample time much more time than the rest of the country to prepare for the pandemic and as well as for this pediatric complication of the pandemic um dr suma has given a wonderful uh, exposition of the whole uh, disease pathology she has laid out the whole diagnostic algorithm very well and i would say that as a pediatric cardiologist i am part of this one team of all of us who need the manifestations of mic it's also quite central to the manifestations of acute covid also and part of the reason is also because the heart has a lot of these as inhibitors which are the targets for the for the uh, coronavirus so um, and cardiac support anticoagulation immunomodulation all of these are key components of the acute care of these patients and many a time it is the extent and severity of the cardiac involvement that actually determines much of the morbidity mortality that is uh, related to uh, misc and it uh, it determines the need for ventilation inotropio stage icu care so therefore the cardiology aspect is quite important and we are also beginning to recognize that in the long term also the cardiac aspects may be very relevant and as a pediatric cardiologist as i assert once again i would consider myself one part of this team a cog in the wheel uh, of the people dealing with misc and uh, my role would be to help connect the dots the primary responsibility is being to identify the various cardio cardiovascular manifestations if they are occurring in a patient to define and quantify these structural and functional abnormalities at various stages firstly at the presentation when a child is coming to us we need to identify whether or not these cardiovascular manifestations are present or not and then we need to do the serial assessments even in patients who do not have uh, cardiac manifestations at the outset you may still need to review the cardiac uh, conditions throughout your treatment and in patients who do who are documented to have cardiovascular manifestations uh, we are increasingly realizing that a long term surveillance is going to be very very important to to really look at what happens to them in the future it it's still a very new disease and there's a lot for us to learn and discover in the future and um, of course the other role for me as a pediatric cardiologist would be to help treat the shock and the other manifestations along with my team members which would include the pediatricians intensivists rheumatologists and other members my role would also be to help our team differentiate this pathology from other similar diseases which could which could mimic this as suma has uh, really explained in quite a detail you know the coronary abnormalities could be missed could be kawasaki disease there could be other causes for ventricular dysfunction there could be other causes for the rhythm abnormalities or abnormalities of myocardial perfusion that we may see here there could be other causes so as a pediatric cardiologist i have to help uh, distinguish between these so what are the main cardiovascular manifestations of misc 
uh broadly they would be and most importantly they would be myocarditis and cardiac dysfunction is 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 one of the most important cardiovascular manifestations and many children actually present with with, with these uh features the second aspect would be uh the presence or absence or characterization of coronary aneurysms then shock which could be either secondary to the myocarditis or it could be secondary to the systemic inflammation and the and and and, and the vasoactive changes that are happening or it can be a combination of a cardiac involvement and the systemic inflammation and arrhythmia so these are the main cardiovascular manifestations that can be seen so what do we mean by myocarditis in the context of misc or in general in general of course all of you are aware that by myocarditis we mean inflammation of the cardiac muscle and uh, in the uh, and in this specific context also from a purely cardiac kind of terminology we define uh, the, the the clinical uh, definition of myocarditis would be if we can demonstrate echocardiographically cardiac dysfunction by which we mean a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 50% and along with uh, elevated cardiac biomarkers and uh, myocarditis would present mostly as ventricular dysfunction heart failure arrhythmias or as cardiogenic shock or rhythm abnormalities as well so um, as to why the myocardial uh, damage is happening it could occur due to direct viral myocardial damage during an acute infection or it could be a response to the hyperinflammation um perhaps it doesn't happen in everybody but there is a probably a genetically more susceptible group of people who are susceptible to this hyperinflammatory damage to the uh, to the myocardium and the ventricular dysfunction could also be due to the extreme degree of cardiac stress which is resulting from the systemic inflammation and the vasogenic responses next slide please so uh, this is how as a cardiologist i would look at the ventricular function these are echocardiograms and uh, on 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 the left you see m mode uh, this is one of the modes in echocardiography where we 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 look at the left ventricle in cross section and we look at the dimensions in the n systole and n diastole and that helps us to calculate the ejection fraction as you can see the ejection fraction in this figure is 60% on the right side that's another technique that we use which is called the simpson's method where in a four chamber view of the heart uh, on 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 the uh, on the 2d mode we we uh, we contour the ventricles in n systole and diastole thereby getting the volumes of the ventricle in n systole and n diastole that helps us to calculate how much blood is being ejected out that's how we calculate the ejection fraction and normally it's about about 55% and uh, by clinical definition of myocarditis whenever it's less than 50% we would uh, call it ventricular dysfunction Uh, talking about the cardiac biomarkers as i said which need to be present along with the echo findings um, the two main sets of cardiac biomarkers that we look at one is the uh, the cardiac troponins and the other are the bnp and uh, pro bnps so cardiac troponins are cardiac regulatory proteins that control the calcium mediated interaction between actin and myosin and this these are considered the standard biochemical marker for the diagnosis of myocardial injury and it can be detected in the serum using monoclonal antibodies and trop t and of trop t and trop i trop i is more specific to the cardiac uh, uh, lesions but both of them in general are highly highly specific for a myocardial injury the second set of biomarkers that we look at which is part of the battery of tests that we would do when we are looking at misc or trying to uh, um, to assess these patients is bnp or nt pro bnp this is a very useful uh, uh, indicator of uh, ventricular dysfunction so uh, the brain natriuretic peptide or the natriuretic peptides are primarily uh, peptides which are produced by the heart and and they are released into circulation whenever there is increased wall tension so um, there are atrial natriuretic peptides and brain natriuretic peptides so bnp is produced by both atria and ventricles so uh, uh, so any rise in these levels is associated with decline in cardiac function so both bnp and the n terminal pro bnp have highly predict are highly predictive for heart failure and ventricular dysfunction and nt pro bnp can be easily done as an elisa assay so these are tests which are which are available at our disposal which help us diagnose so the data is just coming up and we if we ask as to you know what percentage of children with misc would actually get cardiac dysfunction um, the jury is still out but definitely it seems to be a large proportion of children so uh, there have been uh, small case series and now we are beginning to see more uh, sy uh, systematic reviews uh, that are coming in 
so um, some of this so most of this data agrees that the extent of the ventricular dysfunction is in in uh, in most cases more than 50% so this is a study uh, which came out from the us which looked at uh, all the studies which were published until then they said ventricular dysfunction was present in nearly 35 to 100% of patients depending upon the studies that they had that they had looked at in a study by belhajer et al of 35 patients nearly 28% went on to ecmo support 80% needed ventilation and inotropy for cardiac dysfunction another study with 20 patients grimod et al um the median lv ejection fraction was 35% as i said less than 50% is abnormal and nearly 19 out of 20 of them needed inotropes and vasopressors so almost all the studies are showing um uh, the presence of echocardiographic abnormalities and ventricular dysfunction in a high proportion of patients this is another um, uh, systematic review that's come out of kings college and uh, which looked at nearly 1726 papers that had come out until uh, the end of june and they looked at nearly 783 cases and they inferred that the most common sign or symptom that children were presenting with was cardiovascular 82% had tachycardia hypotension was there in 61% abnormal echo was there in 59% trop t uh, and pro bnp were elevated in 68 and 77% uh, respectively and nearly 77% of these people by patients required cardiovascular support and dufort et al who had the largest individual can we go back to previous yeah uh, largest single series with 99 cases nearly 63% of them had cardiovascular compromise so essentially what all these studies are showing is that the, there is a high predominance of cardiovascular manifestation next slide please so this is a study um, this is one of the very initial studies by ashish chikarmani which had come out of the uk again showing a very high prevalence of uh, lv dysfunction in ecg abnormalities next slide please uh this is a recent publication in indian pediatrics this was done by some of my pediatric cardiology colleagues from uh, mumbai so they quickly had formed a registry of uh, of of a misc in mumbai because mumbai was as you know was among the cities to be really hard hit and early hit by covid and uh, they looked at 23 patients from mumbai and 65% had presented with shock 53% of whom had lv dysfunction and cardiogenic shock 65% were clinically defined as clinical myocarditis another study from chennai previous slide please once again it also showed uh, dhan lakshmi et al from chennai also showed inotropy requirement for cardiovascular failure in 57% uh, next slide so what we do infer is that a very large proportion of patients do present with cardiovascular manifestations predominantly as a myocarditis lv lv dysfunction these are echo images from a child who was admitted with us just 4 days back uh, and uh, uh, with misc and her echo shows an ejection fraction of 37.7% next slide please so other than the ventricular dysfunction and myocarditis the other important uh, um, cardiovascular feature that we look for as a cardiologist are coronary abnormalities so very early in 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 the pandemic uh, the series from italy showed there was a 30 per, 30 times increase in the incidence of kd or kd like illness during the pandemic in italy this was when italy was really burning with with the covid and uh, the typical manifestation is coronary dilatation uh, which is very similar to kawasaki disease or you could have a very instead of uh, you know uh, localized aneurysms you could have a diffuse enlargement of the coronaries and both kd and uh, misc do have overlap think features which are indicative of the shared pathophysiology and echocardiographically we measure the coronaries at various points and assign z scores and more than 2.5 z score is regarded as dilated next slide so again numerous studies um, all of which basically uh, state that it's very very important to look for the coronaries uh, in these cases not only if they present with kd like features even when patients who have presenting not like typical kd even there it's very important to look at the coronaries and uh, and and, the, and between 6 to 24% of patients in most studies have been found to have coronary abnormalities uh, ashish chikarmani study from the uk initially where he had looked at 15 patients uh, 93% of them had coronary abnormalities so it's very important to look at the coronaries uh, in all patients of such a of covid as uh, dr suma had already outlined um, there are some basic differences which can help us distinguish between kd and uh, misc these patients who tend to be older they are more likely to present with shock 
they more likelihood of uh, the the cardiac involvement on uh, echo more likely to have elevated trop trop t trop i and bnp and more likely to have higher tlc neutrophil crp fibrinogen more likely to have lymphopenia thrombocytopenia next slide please next slide please um so uh, the other major abnormality that could be observed could be arrhythmias or ecg abnormalities which are not very specific per se but you could have various features that you could see on the ecg which could be non specific st changes qtc prolongation premature atrial or ventricular contractions atrial ventricular blocks atrial fibrillation couple of reports are there and sustained arrhythmias leading to hemodynamic collapse has also been reported other than this you can have uh valvulitis pericarditis pericardial effusion etc can also be cardiovascular features this is just a, a, a graphic on one of the uh, systematic reviews which shows uh, the prevalence of uh, cardiac manifestations uh, showing a good um, good number of patients nearly 54% of patients having abnormal echo ecg and depressed ejection fraction and other cardiovascular manifestations next slide please so um definitely the management of shock as a part of the cardiovascular dysfunction is a very critical part of the management of misc which we need to do in a very systematic manner i'm sure uh, dr rajapan will be speaking about it in greater detail what we do find is that with appropriate management the ventricular functions tend to improve rather uh, rather rapidly and uh, in in many situations uh, uh, it's probably the immunomodulation which has a greater impact on these ventricular functions or at least as much impact as the inotropy and there are cases which where, where people have uh, noted the ventricular functions to improve just with immunomodulation even before they had the opportunity to start uh, inotropy ecg changes also tend to normalize and uh, the coronaries um, uh, if dilated and enlarged they don't really regress so so rapidly and they need a very close serial surveillance to track their normalization next slide please and this is the same case that i showed earlier who had 37% ejection fraction just 4 days later with no inotropy only with immunomodulation the ejection fraction uh, uh, normalized to 55% this is an echo done yesterday next slide the possible long term sequelae are things that we may have to watch out for because the myocardial injury that may be occurring during this process may lead to some long term myocardial scarring and these scars can predispose to future arrhythmias or cardiac dysfunction the coronary thrombosis and who knows maybe in a later in later life uh, greater propensity for coronary artery disease so these patients require serial cardiology imaging and surveillance and in the future we may require um, higher modalities of investigations like cardiac mri in which we can actually assess myocardial scars and ventricular functions in a better way and we may need ct or nucleus scans for the coronary next slide so to conclude cardiovascular manifestations are among the most common and the most defining features of misc and the manifestations are often dramatic but in most cases they may respond to treatment with low early mortality and future surveillance studies will tell what lies in store as far as long term sequelae go thank you very much uh thank you dr makesh uh, for that uh, you have done a lot of new insights into the, uh, the 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 cardiological cardiology aspects of miss and as you have rightly suggested or you have pointed out with the limited evidence available right now from your studies in mumbai and other areas uh, regions and 35 to 40 percent are really involved in uh, that there is some cardiac involvement is there and even without any clinic obvious clinical features even six percent are involved with the echocardiographic findings and, and it's quite uh, been informative for more i believe most of the uh, for all of us and now we will look forward to um, uh, dr rajya pambule uh, to throw light on the the intensive care of this and having dr suma having dissected about the broad guidelines and the phenotype and the guidelines and dr makesh having discussed about thread bear about the the, the um, cardiology aspects uh, dr ajay pambule is here to enlighten us on the how to who can go about on the intensive care side and as the face is uh, phenotype he is a quite a very charming person as already and any time interacted with him and uh, is a consultant in pediatric intensive care unit at the astar medicity i am sure most of us almost all all around are very familiar with this face 
and he has got a, uh, he has had a training in London in the UK from the King's College as well as the Government State Hospital as well as in the and in, in right here he had this training from CMC Bellu. Uh, mostly his training is uh, interest is in the simulation based training and transport and retrieval. And uh, he had a lot of uh, contributions in the index journals as uh, contributed multiple charts in textbooks and faculty simulation. He has been a stellar part. Uh, he is now the presently the, the the leading consultant in pediatric intensive care in the National Medicity, Kochi. And uh, we have got Dr. Rajat Mulla right now here to uh, take us through the intensive care management of MIS, which is, I believe, the, more, the point of care that is most important. Uh, Dr. Rajat Mulla, please. Dr. Raj, you can take over. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, sir, can I have the previous slide? Uh, thank you for the introduction, sir. Uh, as my previous speakers have highlighted here, uh, a good number of patients, almost 75% of the patients with a MISC end up in uh, PICU. Uh, most of them uh, reach as uh, highlighted by Suma and uh, Dr. Mahesh uh, come for cardiac support, hemodynamic support, inotropes, monitoring, etc., etc. And a uh, very small percentage of them get intubated, ventilated, many of them for shock. And when extreme cases or unusual cases like the one which Rojo managed, uh, they get intubated for primary COVID pneumonia, etc., etc. Uh, so next slide, sir. Uh, I think I will start by highlighting the fact that uh, we should not miss the boat. Uh, Dr. Suma has clearly highlighted why it's very important to consider MISC as a differential diagnosis. As, as a, a phenotype or a clinical syndrome, uh, any patients coming with a similar clinical syndrome, anybody coming with shock, anybody coming with unexplained fever, anybody coming with um, uh, sorry, and a GI symptoms, appendicitis-like presentation, etc., etc. At this time, when the pandemic is raging and settling down, we have to keep the possibility of MISC always in mind, uh, primarily because if you think about it, if you suspect, you identify that. And this is a disease which was seen through all the literature presented to us over by the previous speakers. If you identify appropriately immunomodulate and a deep, good supportive care, they do well. We have seen that with the index case presented from Lut. Uh, uh, when I looked at what is the literature available uh, for MISC in, within the intensive care. This is a preprint uh, article uh, which has come out of it's a meta analysis uh, prepared from PGI. Uh, this uh, seed is collected uh, patients starting December 2019 to July 2020. So there may be much more cases to it. Um, uh, included all PIMS or MISC by definition less than 21 years. It included 18 studies and included 833 participants. Uh, so next slide, sir. Uh, so again, uh, like um, what uh, Suma highlighted, the median age was nine years and three, four, 75 percent of the children came into the ICU and majority had an antibody test positive. On the other hand, only one third had RT-PCR positive. And uh, thankfully and interestingly, the mortality was very low. Uh, that was always after identifying an appropriate treatment. And 65 percent, major majority of them came for cardiac involvement as in shock, arrhythmia or myocarditis. And 25% of the kids came into the ICU for ventilation. And you look at it, uh, a big number of patients came for vasoactive drugs. And treatment spectrum, which has already been discussed, I'm not going to go into that. This was the spectrum of. So which, can, which all patients need to come to ICU? Uh, many of them present with poor perfusion. If you assign some symptoms of shock, I'm going to highlight it again. The PALS definition, poor perfusion, prolonged CFT, cold extremities poor urine output, tachycardia. And you have, you have to highlight the fact that dropping blood pressure is a late sign. You specifically look for poor perfusion. If there is evidence of poor perfusion, consider putting them into the ICU. Many of them are tachypneic. Some of them are not. Early, early poor perfusion, they may be acidotic breathing. So watch out for that. If there's a work of breathing, if there's a desaturation or impending respiratory failure, and if you have an altered sensorium, either due to poor perfusion or because of CNC involvement, they need to come to the ICU. Uh, again, taking a leap from uh, uh, the clinical spectrum highlighted by Suma, the two sets of patients who can come to us. One is uh, the subset of patients who has MISC with 
an overlap with acute COVID-19 and without COVID-19. And uh, as highlighted earlier, patients with an overlapping spectrum of COVID-19 are much more harder to speak. The classical NISC without, sorry, previous slides, uh, without overlap um, will usually present with LV dysfunction and vasoplastic shock. Those things have been highlighted. But when they are overlapping with acute COVID, they, many of them need respiratory support, hemodynamic support, and neurological complications, which is less commonly seen. Next slide, sir. Uh, I would clearly highlight when the patient comes to ICU, remember to protect yourself and your team. We have seen one third of these patients can be COVID positive. So look at the COVID status and possibility. You need to decide on standard PPE, full PPE or enhanced PPE. Err on the side of the caution. Don't take chances. Uh, protect yourself and your team. Uh, from management perspective, when they're seen in the emergency department as intensivists, we always go by the air breathing circulation pattern. Uh, do not forget to assess the airway. Yeah, I'll come to intubation, etc. in the next slides. Remember, one of the most common errors happening in the emergency department is that when children come with poor perfusion, we go behind IV line. Many of them are cold, clammy, and you may not get an IV access. Multiple people may be trying for IV access. Somebody will just forget to do simple things like maintaining airway, clearing the secretions, and starting a high flow oxygen. Simple, basic, fast stuff. Don't forget that. Um, and uh, so, um, okay, I think uh, Dr. Jason is giving me hint that I had to finish quickly. Okay, um, so start high flow oxygen. Do not do not forget forget that aspect. Uh, ensure the airway is maintained, and if the airway is, if the patient is having low GCS and having pooling of secretions, ensure you clear the secretions. Uh, next slide, sir. Uh, which are the patients you would like to intubate? If there is evidence of shock, poor perfusion, in spite of fluid resuscitation, they are not improving. If poor perfusion is perfusion, a perfusion is persisting, consider intubation. If there is an impending respiratory failure, you consider intubation. And if low GSS is, GCS is less than 8, consider intubation. Uh, and how do you prepare for intubation? I, I would really like to highlight uh, uh, intubating a child with poor perfusion, myocardial dysfunction. I know the cardiology team would agree with me that we call them as a physiologically difficult airway. Uh, it is, it won't, it's not going to be a simple straightforward intubation because patient's LV function is poor. When you're going to intubate the patient for intubations with pox involved in negative ionotropy, their perfusion is going to go down. Uh, on simple word, their risk of arresting at the time of intubation is very high. So you have to identify this as a high risk intubation. You have to get your team ready. You have to call your seniors, your anesthetist for support hands. You get the best guys around you to come and form a team with you. Ensure you got a good IV access. If you're not able to IV, uh, get a quick IV access if the perfusion is bad, then don't forget your option of intraosseous needles. Um, it'd be quite handy, but ensure you have good IV access. You may need fluid resuscitation. You may need ionotropes. And you should have the most experienced person to intubate the uh, kid. You, you can't give it to a postgraduate or a junior member. Though uh, anatomically, the intubation may be straightforward. Uh, you don't have much time frame to intubate. We don't want a failed intubation. Child can crash. So you are most experienced person. When a patient is having LV dysfunction or myocarditis, my most experienced person should take over the intubation. And uh, uh, we would like to start peripheral inotropes and fluid and emergency drugs to be drawn up like adrenaline, atropine, et cetera, should be drawn up uh, before you prepare for intubation. And when you are intubation, we always prefer to use a cuff ETQ because if the patient develops pulmonary edema down the lane, uh, a cuff ETQ would be quite handy. And when you pick, a, pick and choose the drugs to intubate, uh, cardio safe drugs are preferred. Uh, we prefer ketamine. We avoid midazolam or propofol, any of the negative inotropic drugs, and paralysis, vecuronine. Uh, and definitely sometimes we do start peripheral inotropes to cover over the intubation. So uh, just do not walk into a trap of trying to intubate the child without enough preparation and enough support. You may be in trouble. When you're going, as far as ventilation is concerned, because of time constraints, I'm not going to jump into the details of it. Uh, if your lungs are bad, if you have an ARDS, which is uh, we have not seen, thankfully, so far, and even in the case series are not reported, you have to use a lung protective strategy as a standard intensive care, keeping on a tidal volume of 8 ml per kg and deep titrate to optimize, accept permissive hypercarbia and hypoxemia, and you have to keep the driving pressure less than 15, and all those usual standard dictums are highlighted. And in a patient with primary COVID pneumonia, I don't think this talk 
we are going to cover primary covid pneumonia ventilation that's a talk per se separately prone positioning is always helpful but if there is an overlap of covid and misc you may consider proning on this patients next slide sir uh, there are other advanced respiratory supports like nitric oxide may be needed in some patients but again it's going to tricky when many of them are vasodilated systemically vasodilated but we have to consider where what point you need uh, that is more for a theoretical discussion hfov is an option and ecmo i just try to look at some literature how many children have gone on to ecmo uh, most of them the reports of a primary covid and i didn't see much on misc uh, maybe some of my co panelists if they have some literature coming across where somebody has required ecmo for misc primarily uh, the reversal of the disease is very good with immunomodulation so very very few patients i not seen any literature yet any children with misc going on to ecmo but for primary covid pneumonia yes uh coming to the crux of the talk or management wise it is management of shock most as we know that most of them uh, uh most of the patients present in shock and uh, many of them have primary cardiogenic shock and the vasodilatory shock many as we saw the previous slides and studies significant the modem and myocarditis myocardial dysfunction and um, as well as um, systemic vasodilatation so it is it could be a mixture of both or one or other we have to say when you are trying to re establish perfusion uh, fluid resuscitation most commonly people ask me how much fluid to give the answer is uh, to re establish perfusion appropriately in small aliquots so we give 5 or 10 ml per kg colloids uh, in small aliquots and the catch is to stand there and reassess look at the heart rate auscultate for rails and watch for liver which is a very traditional clinical bedside technique if you are an advanced center or if you have the team around with you use your echo any standard in the echo bedside echo or sonographic assessment is a standard tool in intensive care and emergency medicine today so what i would do is to stand there look at the ivc ensure i am not overfilling the child given small aliquots to ensure appropriate fluid or fluid here you can have two spectrums where you have a significant lv dysfunction where are very limited deep fluid where if it is a systemically vasodilated they may take in more fluid so to start with i don't know which or if this patient is having either one syndrome and other or having a overlap of syndromes so to get it right you need an echocardiogram or an ultrasound look at the ivc filling and fill them appropriately in small aliquots look at the lv function look for b lines so ultrasound could be quite quite handy if you don't have an ultrasound assess clinically and go tread cautiously in terms of fluid resuscitation don't have to push in for colloids you can wait for that uh, would i put in a central venous axis here the catch is uh, many times uh, our standard thought process is to start inotrop we need a central venous axis uh, i have seen this happen many times many people try to get the anesthetist or a senior doctor to come and put in and then the, 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 the delay in starting the inotropes so i would like to highlight the fact that it's very very appropriate to start a peripheral dose of inotropes if it is dopamine it is okay dopamine or if you can start peripheral dose of adrenaline in the peripheral line there is a peripheral concentration start on it wait for if at all you are going for a central venous axis and awake femoral axis is feasible can be attempted but if you are trying to sedate the patient for a central venous line in insertion keep in mind most of your sedative drugs can push down the patient further the lv uh, cardiac output can go down further and patient can crash so you have to be prepared for that or possibly i would intubate support and then go for a uh, central line if i need it and it's a standard part now most of the igv insertions are under usp guidance i want to highlight one more thing do not delay inotropes for want of central venous line start peripheral and try to get your support for putting in the central line next very common question people ask me is with the best inotrop to start is it adrenaline or adrenal dopamine if your hospital has only dopamine start it uh, something is better than nothing so can start in peripherally adrenaline and noradrenaline if you have hypotension and if you have lv dysfunction start an inotrop if you have significantly lowish diastolic peripherally vasodilator and patient is fluidly leaky you can start pressors noradrenaline and again one of the most common errors people make is very, people start a very minuscule dose of inotrop and try to titrate up i would easily start something like a 0.1 or 0.2 uh, cardiology uses much lower doses than that 
point one will be a good start point, and try to rate up and down to achieve adequate uh, perfusion. When do we start mildrenone and dobutamine? So previous slides. Huh? Uh, mildrenone and dobutamine. Mildrenone and dobutamine is not a drug to be started in emergency. If the patient is hypertensive, you have to ensure a good blood pressure, and then electively you can introduce mildrenone to support as an ionodilator. Uh, so I want to highlight again: if the patient is having significant LV dysfunction, start on adrenaline, and uh, mildrenone not to be started in emergency department. And once the patient's BP is established and perfusion is reasonable, or if for improving perfusion, you can start mildrenone. In the intensive care unit, and I also want to tell that ionotropic titration is to the perfusion and not to the blood pressure. Particularly when you have a very weak LV, uh, achieving a normal blood pressure at the cost of high ionotrop and tachycardia is harmful. So if you are able to achieve good peripheral perfusion, include good peripheral pulses, warm warming up of periphery, urine output improving, heart rate coming down. That is acceptable, even the blood pressure is slightly less than the age-appropriate blood pressure of the patient. Next slide, sir. And very importantly, uh, is a standard intensive care dictum. Positive pressure is an ionotrop. This is the mechanism in which I don't have time to explain through it. Applying, giving, produce, delivering positive pressure is an ionotrop for a failing heart. Anybody with LV dysfunction, cardiac failure, positive pressure acts like an ionotrop. So I would definitely, sir. Next slide, sir. I would definitely consider putting the patient early on non-invasive ventilation. Non-invasive ventilation is something all pediatricians can be familiar with because it is very easy to initiate. So if you can, if you have a BiPAP, uh, you can start off a BiPAP. HFNC uh, doesn't deliver much PEEP, so your your utility of uh, HFNC as to deliver PEEP is very limited. Uh, I would definitely use PEEP. Uh, using a BiPAP device, and if they have an LV dysfunction, start off with non-invasive. Many times with uh, a non-invasive ventilation and ionotropic support, we can have somehow avoid ventilation in many patients as well. So consider uh, early starting of BiPAP. Uh, how do you monitor patient blood pressure? I have explained why it is very important to target perfusion. Age-appropriate blood pressure, you know, but you don't be very adamant about getting a target age-appropriate blood pressure. Ensure you got good perfusion. How do you and ensure you have good perfusion? I told you warming up peripheries, good urine output, evidence of good peripheral perfusion. Look at the lactate. If lactate is clearing, that is good enough. And if you have a central venous axis, you can look at the SCVO2. If, if you have an appropriate SCVO2, uh, you can be rest assured. Don't try to push the blood pressure up. You know, again, when you try to push the blood pressure up, you may be using too much of adrenaline. Results in tachycardia, and it in fact worsens myocardial ischemia. Uh, invasive RTV line can be placed whenever feasible. NIBP can be tricky, particularly more so when the patient is having edema. Uh, you can have a lot of fallacious reading. You can be completely misled. If possible, try to place an invasive RTV line. And echo has to be done frequently to monitor. And um, Dr. Mahesh has already highlighted the importance of doing regular echoes. As we as intensivists, we do bedside echoes to monitor how patient is responding to the inotropes and how we are getting out of the situation. Next slide, sir. Fluid and electrolytes. I start off restricted. All critically ill patients, we start two-third IV fluids. And sometimes if there's a significant LV dysfunction, I start with 50% IV, 50 of the maintenance. I use isotonic fluids. I don't use uh, hypotonic fluids. Dextrose normal saline or normal saline, depending on the sugar. Diuretics needs to be started. After ensuring good blood pressure, good perfusion, I usually start with the infusion or very small doses after ensuring and maintaining a good perfusion and titrate it up. Diuretics play a very important role to decongest the patient. But when you look at it, the patient even say presents with significant LV dysfunction, we don't give a diuretic at presentation. That is few hours after patient is stabilized, establishing good perfusions. The intensivist or the treating doctor take a careful decision when to introduce diuretics. Monitor the fluid balance carefully. Most commonly done error is we calculate the total fluid, but we forget the drugs. Uh, we forget the flushes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If the child is a very small child, all these things matters. Uh, please measure each and every ml of the fluid which goes into the child. Uh, initially, on day one, patient may have some positive fluid balance because of the fluid resuscitation we do. But subsequently, then you achieve at least neutral fluid balance and then subsequently negative fluid balance. Watch it very closely. Put in fluid only what is essential. If you put in too much, it may be difficult to get out. 
and uh, ensure you start an early enteral nutrition in all these patients, which is a much more physiological way of uh, providing nutrition and uh, stabilization. Some of these patients can develop into acute kidney injury. It's beyond the scope of this talk to delve deep into all these, these things. PD may not be very helpful in fluid removal and uh, for support as well. So CRRT is preferred. We also know that the most of these patients who get into multi-system involvement with renal failure will also be ventilated and uh, in hemodynamic compromise. So uh, CRRT is preferred. Cost is a very deterring factor, but uh, CRRT is useful. Cytosop, theoretically, we think that there's an immune uh, mediator process going on. Why don't you use cytosop and remove some immune mediators? Child can get better. So far, cytosop used in adults did not show any uh, mortality or morbidity benefit. So it is not as of now recommended. One of the major problems faced by uh, our colleagues across the country was frequent filter clogging because of the hypercoagulable state in um, MISC. So ensure you use pre-filter and heparin monitor uh, coagulation. Citrate can be used for renal support. Next slide, sir. Uh, neurological complications, uh, not very frequently seen, but this is the spectrum of neurological complications you can have. You can have meningitis, you can have acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, brainstem encephalitis, guillain barre Apparently, I not read the article. I saw a newspaper article where Mumbai reported a lot of post-COVID guillain barre myositis, etc. So essentially, uh, here, like what Roju did, uh, you have to be, treat this um, disease, spect uh, disease syndrome. Like if you have status, you go follow the status and uh, status of case management protocol. If you have evidence of raised intracranial pressure, use uh, decongestant phosphotherapy and uh, uh, neuroprotective therapy. Uh, that are the essential things which we need to use. Hypercoagulability, uh, anticoagulation becomes a standard uh, part of the mistreatment. Dr. Suma and Dr. Uh, Mahesh has highlighted that. But keep in mind, do not forget using stockings, DVT pump, etc. in older children. So younger children may not need it, but 12-year-old, 13-year-old, many of our children are off late, very obese. So we have to treat them like adults. Do not forget using stockings and DVT pump. It will be really bad if they develop a complication. Uh, I would. Uh, there is much, much more to discuss and delve deep. We have only 15 minutes, so I'm going to hold back. I can answer any of your queries at a later time. One point, this is one last slide I want to highlight. Um, what do we do? Most of these centers don't have um, a support system to manage such multi-organ uh, involvement patients. So what we do is one of the most uh, important thing is communication. Uh, if you want to send a patient with MISC, uh, you uh, have to communicate with your referral hospital, ensure the patient has bed, because as of now, we have serious bed shortage issues. You block your patient's bed. And second thing, uh, our ambulance crew or nurse or ED team and all don't know what is the difference between COVID and the post-COVID disease. So the moment they see COVID somewhere in the referral should not, you know, the patient will be going to the isolation, getting stuck there, and it will delay the whole process. So please communicate it very effectively and uh, coordinate very well. It is very important when you refer a patient with this. Start off with high oxygen. I would ask NRM uh, uh, if the patient has poor perfusion. Uh, have a non rebreather mask, 15 liters flow. You start and send out the patient. Do not send the patient without starting oxygen. It definitely improves uh, oxygen carrying capacity and may have a uh, compromised cardiac output state. And uh, if you have to give a bolus with poor perfusion, please carefully titrate the fluid bolus. Don't give large volume fluid boluses. Give a small volume fluid boluses over a longer period while transport. And please consider starting peripheral line drop. You can even start peripheral concentration adrenaline. It is way better and the outcome is way better if you start a peripheral inotrop and send the patient when the patient is in shock. IVIG and steroids, as Suma told, uh, please discuss with your referring doctor, rheumatologist, and uh, that has to be a carefully decided discussion uh, where you need to give it IVIG or not. That can wait until probably, or if your receiving doctor is in agreement with you, you may consider giving it as well. And end of the day, this is a teamwork. You have to get all your team together, your pediatrician. You need your cardiologist who is going to tell you uh, how the heart is going around, what to do and what not to do. Rheumatologist who will tell you the uh, immunomodulation and intensivist who is going to provide the uh, support take care. So when all this team work come together, we are sure that we can bring out most of the children out uh, in a very uh, healthy way. Uh, with that, I would try to conclude my talk on this. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. 
Uh, well, Dr. Raja Pumbale, that was an excellent uh, presentation, a quick but comprehensive journey through the intensive care of uh, MISC patients. And, and you are asked meticulous as ever, you are trying to cover the entire aspects, and as you put, that's a teamwork in the end. <clears throat> Pediatrician, with dermatologist, cardiologist, and intensivist, all working together. Uh, Jason, sir, how much time can we take for this? We have a lot of questions around. 20 minutes? 15, 20 minutes. I think so. I think the, you take you take all the questions. You all the important questions must be answered. Very important. Chat box is most important in a webinar. And doctor, I am so happy that Dr. Shija uh, was around with a lot of discussion. Dr. Shaji Thomas John, Dr. Rebi, and all our Dr. Kulkarni, all are around, Dr. Phanu. So that's a great team around. And thanks, Dr. Shija, because in fact she has contributed a lot to Rojo's presentation also. And she is one who is out there to help us in the future with a lot of possibly post-COVID scenarios. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's good. Uh, one important question has come from Dr. Vijay Krishnan and Dr. Anchu Kanmani is from Trivandrum, I know. Uh, any further, Dr. Rojo or Dr. Suma both can take up. Any further follow-up and circulate to the follow-up, the case which Rojo has presented, or in fact, the most common post-COVID circulate that, that summarizes it so. so uh, Post-COVID secondly, because many people, many are worried, and especially in children, what you presume, you are not sure about, and it's not a time for us to post-COVID secondly to, to have a robust evidences, but still you have got something in your sleeves. Thank you. Yes. I think uh, Rojo, uh, Rojo will talk about this child. Um, uh, however, usually I think many of our children are doing very well in uh, what we've seen so far, they're doing very well on follow-up. We haven't had any uh, Miss KD yet with very large aneurysms. We, we've had a few who had bradycardia, who needed uh, some ocipinilin for a couple of weeks. Whether that bradycardia was uh, pulsed here, or when you give high dose methyl prednisolone, you can see bradycardia for some time, whether it was related to that, or whether there was some uh, transient myocardial issues secondary to the disease, we don't know. Uh, that is the maximum we have seen so far. Uh, Rojo's patient has been discharged recently. He will have a better. Uh, before that, Rojo, when was your patient discharged? How, how long it is now? How is it time to subsidize any post-COVID circulate? No, sir. It was discharged only recently, sir. Maybe around 10 days back. So it's not a time. That's why it's a... Eh? But, but then I, what do you think? Yeah, when you when are just scanning the literature, what do you feel? When I'm in constant touch with the parents over phone, they keep on calling me every day or two. Uh, and what I le could learn from them was like the child was slightly more better when compared to the discharge. And child was, uh, I mean, accepting more feeds and uh, let's say the movements have come down, the seizures have not there. And um, and it's, uh, it's mo become more responsive to the parents also. The overall, they feel that the neuro behavior is slightly bo more better after discharging from the hospital. So as you, as Sir and Madam has mentioned, it's not the right time to comment about all these things. But still, Rojo, uh, being uh, the caretaker of that particular patient, you might have gone through literature quite often. So what exactly could be the circular in the offing? Maybe it's now six months around. So what, what have we gathered from the literature? Um, I'm um, mostly worried about the neurological circular because uh, that's already the child had hypoxic manifestations uh, in the brain as per the MRI. There's changes are there in the periodontic areas and basal ganglia areas actually. So, so I'm only one skeptical thing is like since the child is a new, I mean, growing child, I hope the neuronal plasticity might work. So the chances of having a severe sequelae might be on the lesser side. But I'm keeping my fingers crossed meant hoping that the child may come out with lesser sequelae, but I'm not telling that the sequelae won't be there. Definitely sequelae will be there. Hope it is a minor sequelae, not that a major sequelae actually. But we have to watch for any hearing problems, visual problems, motor manifestations, sensory abnormalities, and more importantly, behavioral as well as long-term, emotional as well as a cognizant problems also. Uh, Roger, can I ask, or Nishija is here, or is, is there any adults we talk about pulmonary fibrosis and other things post-COVID? Can you take something like on the pulmonary complications, pulmonary issues, circulate? Yes, I am talking about a circulate at large. I am not talking, talking about the your uh, dystonia in this particular patient. This patient, I'm not sure about the pulmonary circulate, sir, because um, this kid didn't have much of pulmonary problems except for the day three that pulmonary infiltrates was in, and we could easily recover, recover from that also. And uh, 
other possible sequelae could be as you mentioned this can be have a myocardial fibrosis it's on the cards pulmonary fibrosis not sure liver dysfunctions was there not sure whether the pulmonary uh, hepatic fibrosis also sets in and uh, these were the common complications the child came into picture actually any comments dr shija or any any other panelist dr makesh is here uh, dr suma i think i'll just uh, share what we have come across at sct yes. we have had around 25 cases of misc so far and uh, what we find different from all the literature that has been discussed today very excellent presentation by all the panelists very nice discussions but uh, what is different i would like to say is that almost 80% of our cases we treated with methylprep and we have had very excellent results with that so i think that is something that others can also explore of it because uh, ivag was given only for five patients baki 20 patients we had managed with methylprep pulses so we are happy with the treatment that is going and another thing i would like to say that even those patients who were covid antigen positive those whom for whom we send the covid antibody that is all the patients who were covid antigen negative covid antibody was sent majority were covid antibody positive but not all majority were but not all but in those patients who were rt pcr positive in them also the significant number had a covid antibody positivity so i feel that even then when you get an rt pcr positivity it may be just a dead virus there there is a chance of uh, covid and um, means um, immune response or you are already in the post covid state probably and remdesivir we had given only for one patient and uh, regarding the pulmonary complications most of them had breathlessness at admission some of them had bilateral as well as unilateral infiltrates but a respiratory support per se didn't take long definitely didn't take long ventilation ranged from 2 to 4 days most did without ventilation some did ventilation some required niv and most of the cardiac supports you could wean them off by 24 to 48 hours one child with a very bad lv dysfunction or multiple inotropes required almost 4 to 5 days of inotropes otherwise most of them by 48 hours regarding arrhythmias we have seen junctional rhythm and bradycardia was a very common manifestation but uh, in fact we didn't really opt for tachy um, for um, like beta agonist beta agonist because most of them were asymptomatic even though they had that bradycardia and uh, regarding that cardiac dysfunction even when there was a cardiac dysfunction most of them had significant vasodilatation so thankfully fluid resuscitation going on for pulmonary edema was not a feature that we saw thank you shija uh, can i just uh, ask that's a, a lovely yes, summary um what was the the mean age of the patients you saw ours was higher madam definitely it was 8 to 9 years many of them 11 year 12 year less than 5 years maybe i would say 20 percentage 80 percent would more than 5 years yes so th- that's a very very important point the older children tend to present more like the toxic shock syndrome yes madam uh, phenotype and this yeah. is the phenotype you can get away with methylprep yeah yes madam that the phenotype will exactly most likely right. need to use ivig as well the older child uh, you can think about methylprep yeah. and those and in that shock syndrome high doses will be required yeah it's always high dose madam you're using 30 mg per kg with the actually the kd type the severe myocarditis type it might mm-hmm. be better to use slightly lower doses actually some of them don't tolerate mm-hmm. very high doses uh, in that way that's the only there's a bit of caution aired by others so, madam what do we expect uh, when we are using a higher dose i think they had problems with hemodynamic issues in those patients i mean especially for the western literature they were actually guarding uh, this thing there of course there is another issue there their children tend to be quite obese so i yeah, think uh, ah, so the like, uh, same doses but because we didn't have really that problems it might be a pretty high dose as well so that that also we need to pick up and we compare but you have to be a little careful in the uh, myocarditis without a severe shock that kind of scenario a little bit careful there when with the steroid we had kept a ceiling dose of 1 gram yeah and in That's fact awesome. we didn't have till now touch wood we did have an issue we'll see excellent ma'am can i suggest that you have got two different age groups mostly and the- <clears throat> i don't be combine the series with you in uh, amrita in kochi nasulas in divan the sat and have a uh, you have a public uh, study where you can publish because this is something which is very comparable uh, means in the sense brings out a very uh, significant 
difference in the outlook and approach or where you in the management you have got two different cohorts here right now here so uh, why don't you try the sat and what uh, dr suma has got a lot of patients here two different age groups mostly and two different impacts on right now this carries definitely anything about covid is significant right now because we are in the learning phase till now and as i know i have in some 250 300 groups right now about some groups every day cohort covid study covid study everybody is coming out with some more other thing you definitely has to bring out as a iap office bar i must suggest that you you we have to look forward to it because we are so that is something that we lack we don't have the push where as you dr suma was rightly pointing out initiative itself we don't have any so far kolkata series or bombay series as dr mahesh has put it we don't have a series on rwanda or cochin which has not been published why don't we take it together and then this is a comparative good study where comparative Oh, values are there, and uh, I'm not going into it. But uh, you just explore the possibilities. Meantime, uh, we have got another question. Uh, already, Dr. Suma has discussed the chat box, but I would like to have to take in the common platform here because there many of them will not have gone to the chat box. Bradycardia, in the sense, in the MC after the acute episode of shock results, bradycardia after the medication of methyl prednisolone. Just have a brief out uh, insight into it. Bradycardia, how it happens, why it happens. and how it should be tackled i think we've seen this uh, consistently in a few patients that as they get better they seem to develop a quite a significant bradycardia we've had patients with heart rate dropping to the 30s and the 40s with maintained cardiac output uh, so they have not been symptomatic from the bradycardia except i think the care as a nurses and doctors were getting more affected by it than the patient themselves as a couple of these patients i mean mahesh will elaborate we have actually put on orcipril when we noticed that it was not settling we put on orcipril and we were able to completely withdraw and stop it in a matter of uh, i think for one child it was by discharge itself we could do that for another child we had to call her back after discharge after two weeks and do a brief single day admission stop the drug and uh, see that the you know the heart has returned to normal the rate has returned to normal now it is well known that iv methylprin does have a tendency to cause bradycardia and this is something i have seen previously in my lupus and systemic patients also once in a while i have never needed really to use any drug to lift it up previously but in the covid scenario there are couple of patients we had to use osipinilin i wouldn't be alarmed by it um uh, however i think you know definitely get the cardiologist to help you out there yeah i agree with dr suma largely in what she said and and the reason for the bradycardia could be the impact of the medications or it could be because of the 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 effect of the elevated inflammatory cytokines on the sinoatrial node and the conduction tissue mostly what we find is sinus bradycardia and medications uh, for mineral fat medications which yes, medication? methyl prednisolone yeah okay so uh, so these could be the reasons and then of course the 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 whatever level of myocardial hypoxia or injury is happening that could also be contributing to it so usually it is uh, transient and uh, we are not excited by it unless it is hemodynamically significant so in most cases uh, there is a recovery that happens and uh, in uh, we have, we've never have had to you know uh, try to boost it with uh, with Uh, any other uh, uh, chronotropic agents other than the like dr suma said the use of orcipril in a couple of patients we never had to pace anybody we've not needed to consider pacing anybody and most of these patients remain hemodynamically stable and we need not hyper react to it and uh, we just need to carefully watch them that's it that's wonderful takes on dr suma as well as dr mahesh uh, and the question from dr andagoras has already been addressed by dr rajakum bilai by colloids instead of crystalloids for fluid resuscitation i believe that is a typo dr rajakumla himself has corrected it crystalloids uh, instead of normally uh, well from my side there is a one query but dr rajo you put it as the you always see that the neutrophil by nbt nbl ratio is something about more than 4 is to 1 when you see something like covid that is something of the initial learning when we have but then your patient had initially showed something like a neutrophils are around 46 and lymphocytes are around 50 is it have does it have i mean what relevance has it got how important it is and how you frequently you see all these distorted versions of neutrophil to lymphocytes because that um that I mean i just doubt i also had sir i have been discussing with dr suma regarding this 
but what is what we found that uh, we actually we had some three or four covid related patients uh, similar to this and all of them we don't see the typical lymphocyte i mean some of them will have the lymphocyte spikes some maybe because of stress the neutrophils are pretty more in this particular baby and um, that could be the only reason but as the child progress say one minute is it because of the is it peculiar to misc or i am asking about covid at large covid at large is it n by t n by l ratio 4 is 1 or above 4 is 1 something like your patient had something very different picture at presentation as you showed in the first slide that's what mm -hmm. i am saying Yes, sir. Most probably, it could be because of stress or inflammation that would have rise the neutrophils more than the lymphocytes. I guess. Actually, I think the thing we need to look at in uh, MISC and in COVID cases is that the there is lymphopenia, because the virus works through the cell mediated immunity channel, and there is lymphopenia in these patients. They often they might have a total count might be low or on the low normal range. and they might have if you they might have something like 80 85% neutrophils with hardly 10% lymphocytes and uh, that is the more striking thing actually that you tend to see in these patients in fact conventional teaching for those patient that presentation had a lymphocytes around 56% if i am not wrong the first slide mm -hmm. and neutrophil around 30 40 something like which caught yes, my attention that's all and whether it's yeah we are not treated much covid So, in fact, if you see the third day when the child had worsened, the fever spikes were more. There was a total leukopenia was there. The count was only five thousand. From fifty thousand is dropped to five thousand actually. So the virus became. I mean, maybe the become things became becoming more worse on the third day, and the child had seizures, recurrent seizures on the day three, and when the symptoms. I mean, everything started collapsing from day three actually. Well, Dr. Rajesh Pumbale or Dr. Mahesh, anything else to contribute for the discussions here? From your side, you got a wonderful <laughs> take uh, through us. If not, uh, I believe it was a wonderful uh, discussion. Uh, interesting case from Roger. As reasons are as put it, unique case of sepsis. This, uh, even I was wondering. They, they, I didn't see that today morning. Afternoon only, I saw the slides and then I see unique case sepsis. But the presentations were quite unique. And all the experts have taken taken us through something different. This is what you can do maximum for a COVID. And our understanding about COVID is still you have the learning phase, but lot more. Uh, but I believe you have to go come out with a series of cases there and the public. Um, uh, some uh, this is Shija as well as Dr. Uh, Soma as well as Mahesh. All by the all you are working in institutes, you can take up together. We need to have more of articles are coming up. And I'm so happy that we have lot of uh, staff was joined. Dr. Hima Bindu is there. Dr. Uh, Banu Vikramble and uh, Dr. George Paul and all many seniors are around for us for the day. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity for for me to come with you to be with you on this evening. And especially I was also quite a lot of learning for me also on the uh, misc as well as COVID today. Uh, thank you so much, Jason sir, as IAP Cochin, Dr. Pramod as well as Dr. Sajit and all the team around in IAP Cochin. Over to Dr. Jason or sir or Dr. Pramod to conclude for the concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. It was fantastic to have you for this uh, session. We really felt wanted to felicitate you before your election uh, campaign, during your election campaign. But we couldn't do it then. We no. were so busy. We asked you a few times whether you could come and uh, you know uh, be part of the potpourri. But that time you were too busy. So that's why we took this first opportunity to felicitate you and have you for one of our potpourri sessions. Mm -hmm. And we're thankful that you we postponed all your other programs for this. Thank you so much. Over to Pramod for the vote of thanks. Um, it was a very wonderful session, and I I must congratulate all the panelists for the excellent discussion and uh, the inputs you have given. And uh, uh, personally, I have had the misfortune or uh, fortune I can't tell of uh, seeing few patients and uh, really struggling to. do know what to do and i been in constant uh, touch with dr suma and uh, else for their guidance and uh, so this is not a very rare scenario per se and uh, we should be in the outlook for it so even if you are working in a small center there is a possibility you can stumble upon it and, and this is this has to be an eye opener for everybody 
and uh, i'm very glad that uh, we are uh, we have had such an excellent discussion and i thank everyone who has joined today and i thank all the speakers for their excellent deliberation and especially dr ramesh uh, sir for chairing the session and dr suma dr rojo dr mahesh dr rajapan pillai for uh, their deliberations and uh, dr shija from trivandrum for uh, contributing and like uh, dr ramesh sir said uh, probably we can collaborate collaborate uh, on a series study or uh, something can be planned and uh, with those i uh, thank you all and uh, good night thank you thank you thank you so much everybody jisan sir and all the faculty for the making it thank you thank you suma thank you mahesh raj shija everybody thank you so much thank you sir and thank, thank you, you. ladda ma'am is here thank you so much ma'am just now listen